good morning, everybody, and good afternoon for those that are attending uh, in the East Coast or other time zones. Uh, my name is Anthony Caoli. I'm the Regional Director, Contractor for the Alaska Region Training and Technical Assistance Center. We're a resource of the Administration for Native Americans, and uh, we're operated by Three Star Enterprises, which is a Alaska Native Village Corporation subsidiary based out of Perryville, Alaska. That's a Lutuk village. Um, so um, today we're we're hosting the first Alaska Virtual Home Visiting Sustainability Summit. Um, we're focusing on home visiting as a strategy, and um, we have a lot of presenters today. It's kind of a unique format. Um, we are we're we're doing this in conjunction with the programmatic assistance for tribal home visiting. And um, when when Pat reached out to me uh, right around the time of the ACF grantee meeting, uh, we were exploring ways to address sustainability for home visiting programs in Alaska. And uh, since we're on the ground here and we have a lot of contacts, um, it, it made sense to, to partner with Pat and explore this. Because this issue of sustainability not only affects home visiting programs, but all of the projects and programs that A and A funds as well. Um, so it's it's a common theme and element that we're all working to address. Um, so to open this morning, um, I've invited Lee Stefan. He's the president of the Native Village of Aklutna, and uh, he's going to he's going to be doing the opening blessing. Native Village of Aklutna is the a uh, federally recognized tribe for the Anchorage area, and uh, we're, we're hosting this meeting from downtown Anchorage. So um, NVE has been very active in the, with ICWA and other children's issues, and um, it's, it's really an honor that uh, Lee is, is here to open this for us this morning. So Lee, I'll let you. Anthony. Greetings. Hello, friends. Lee Step from TCA Glee Clan. My name is Lee Step. TC Clan. My clan is Opie Pink Clan. Anna, maiden name is Isa. My mother's maiden name. Kinan, good name you. Kirehina Ina. Thank you, you come here. For this to be a long and beneficial uh, start and it'd be something really. I have a prayer for everybody. I don't know if we should stand or sit there. Heavenly Father, bless this gathering today. See to it each and every one who step forward to become home visit caregivers are in turn cared for as they personally need to be. Each them and all who can hear through your actions, your words, just ask and ye shall receive. Is there something granted to those? Is something granted to those who care for the less fortunate, for children, for elderly, and for the infirm? Guide those, O oh Heavenly Father, who have taken the on the life-changing task of caring for those who have become in need. Please, O oh Lord, see to it the resources and media needed to fulfill. Holy support this good work comes to fruition before everyone's very eyes. To all those who are here to teach, to provide, to participate, the blessing they richly deserve. Bless the food we shall eat later today to nourish our bodies and solidify your words. Watch over all of us as we travel to and from this gathering. Hold and protect our families as we are away from them today, carrying on your word and word. All this we praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So next we have um, Petra Smith, and uh, I'm re really happy that Petra was able to come up to Alaska and um, be able to 
co-host is with us here on the ground. I uh, thought that was really important, and uh, we're happy that that happened. Uh, Petra's been working extremely hard with us to uh, put the agenda together and uh, get different presenters and stuff. So um, she's going to cover the summit objective today and go over the agenda, and then she's going to talk about a sustainability model that PATH has been using. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. I am um, privileged to be here, and as Anthony said, it uh, worked out that I was able to travel up here, and I'm honored <laughs> that I can participate in person. Um, the objective for the meeting today um, The objective for the meeting today, <clears throat> during the first part of the meeting, we will learn more about home visiting, the uh, outcomes of home visiting, and then also hear the perspectives of um, home visiting in Alaska. And then the second part of the meeting today, we will hear from a number of speakers that are uh, providing overviews of their organizations and also ideas for collaboration and partnership with home visiting. And the last part of the meeting today, we will break out into discussion groups to talk about and discuss opportunities for strengthening home visiting through funding and partnership and other resource opportunities. So to get us started, um, so to get us started, I wanted to provide a little bit of an overview of how we can look at sustainability in a broader sense. So in order to do that, we compiled six primary sustainability opportunity or strategies. And so in thinking about the, uh, the sustainability, we want to think about in a, in a broader sense incorporating other uh, strategies other than uh, funding. So the first one of those opportunities, and you can see that as in the center because it is the center and one of the foundations of sustainability, um, is the clear vision and, and um, mission of the home visiting program. And that is the foundation. Um, the, the clear vision helps you communicate with partners and stakeholders in order to gain their interest in the program, they need to understand what you're trying to achieve with the home visiting program. The second strategy is collaboration and partnerships. Um, thinking about uh, partners and collaborators that can be a voice or a liaison, an advocate for home visiting. So building those strong communication, those strong connections with collaborators and, and uh, stakeholders and partners provides a stronger network of um, voices and support that can speak for um, home visiting and can strengthen home visiting. So in this context, you can think about strategies that will, collab will build collaborations and champions and how also they can be utilized um, creatively and engaged creatively. So the next one is um, is infrastructure and resources, and that really is the heart of the home visiting program. Those are the services that they are being provided, the um, strategies that are being engaged, the home visits, the home visits that are being um, conducted, and the training that's being provided for home visiting staff. And that can also be. Um, a great sustainability opportunity where you can understand where in your infrastructure or where, where you have resource needs and how partnerships can help with that and fulfill that. So good, uh, a good example of that might be professional development, that you can partner with another organization in the community that maybe have similar outcomes, and you can partner and maybe even pull professional development resources or funding to then provide shared training for your staff between both organizations. So that's an example of that. And in financing, when thinking about financing as a sustainability strategy, think about maybe think of, of um, looking for multiple funding sources. So thinking again about your infrastructure, 
needs in your home visiting program and thinking about what pieces of in your infrastructure or what pieces of your program can be supported by what financing option. And then thinking about strategically how to um, combine financing for your home visiting program. And then policy and community environment, um, thinking about this in the context of what is going on in the community, what are your community values, um, who, is, um, who is the voice in the community, what are the community outcomes, and how does home visiting fit within that community structure? Where are those opportunities where home visiting can be easily integrated in some of those structures where there are shared outcomes, and where perhaps in that community environment may be some barriers and you can jointly try to remove those. And overarching around that, you can see that data and continuous improvement is part of that overall circle of sustainability. So this is where you can use data um, and community re and con uh, continuous improvement to strengthen your program, but you can also think about what kind of data you have, how you can leverage that data to communicate your outcomes about your home visiting program, and also create messages about your home visiting program. So again, thinking about sustainability in a larger frame, in a more holistic manner, and thinking about all of those strategies combined. And now I have the privilege of introducing our first two speakers. And both speakers will be talking about the home visiting program and how that is an effective, proven, and cost-effective strategy for families and communities. The first speaker we have today is Maria Gale. And Maria is the program director for Programmatic Assistance for Tribal Home Visiting. And Maria will be talking more in a general sense about home visiting and what those proven outcomes are and why it's an effective program. And then we'll be joined by Deb Baldwin. And Deb Baldwin um, is the Director of Child Development for Rural Alaska Community Action Program. Deb was also one of our planning committee members, so we really appreciate her input and her expertise along the way to plan this event. So we will begin with Maria, which will, who will provide the first part. Great. Thanks, Petra. Okay. And I... <laughs> Please go ahead, Maria. Okay. Um, I don't know if you're changing the slides. I am still seeing. Uh, thank you. That is me. Um, so. Hi, everybody, and thank you for making time today to think and learn together about home visiting in Alaska. And as Petra said, I'm just going to start off with a brief overview of home visiting. I know many of you have a deep understanding already, but I think it's good to remember that even though the field has grown tremendously over the past decade and there is definitely a lot more familiarity, there are still lots of questions and differences and perceptions and perspectives about what home visiting is. Um, at its most basic, home visiting is a mechanism for service delivery where trained professionals meet families wherever they're at to provide information and support with the intention of impacting healthy child development. And in today's context, we're really talking about families that are expecting a child or who have very young children, usually under the age of five. Um, there is variation in home visiting programs. For example, the intended audience, uh, frequency and duration of services, and which child and family outcomes a particular program might focus on. But despite these differences, the growth of home visiting as a field is really grounded in research that demonstrates positive, short, and long-term outcomes for children and families who receive the service. So why home visiting? And we know that throughout both history and across cultures, new parents have always needed and received help. 
Any new parent will likely tell you that becoming a parent is one of the most joyful and profound experiences and that it's also one of the most difficult. And this is true for everyone. In the first years of a child's life, parents are playing the most active and influential role in their baby's healthy growth and development. And if other stressful events are occurring during this early period, which again is a vulnerable period for everyone, those additional supports become even more important. All parents need support, and for parents facing obstacles such as those caused by stress, language barriers, historical trauma, geographic and social, social isolation, or their own childhood experiences which may have left them without a positive parenting model, the support is really critical. Home visiting really positively impacts a parent's ability to fully support their baby's development during these early years. Next slide, please, Petra. So as I mentioned, um, there are many differences across programs, and it can be helpful to differ differentiate programs um, in terms of a continuum. And here we're considering a continuum based on service intensity, which is often aligned with a family's needs. So um, the more support needed, usually the more intensive the service needed. Um, universal programs are those that are offered to every parent, and this may be every parent in an identified catchment area or every new parent who's delivered their baby at a particular hospital. But universal programs tend to be a lighter touch, often providing screening, basic information, um, and they also often serve as a gateway for families who do need more ongoing support or different kinds of resources. Targeted programs are more focused, um, usually somewhat time limited, um, but often aimed at addressing a particular issue or aspect of need. And those intensive programs are often the ones we think of first um, when we think of home visiting. Um, these are more intensive programs. They typically aim to impact a broad range of outcomes and provide a much more significant level of service usually through regular visits over a multi-year time period. Next slide. So there are several factors, I think, that have been important to this continued expansion and interest in home visiting. And these are a few of the aspects that really provide the most compelling reasons why this continued attention and support for home visiting has occurred. Um, we know that when home visiting is implemented well, it has proven and lasting positive impacts that have been demonstrated by the research. Um, we also know that home visiting, um, as part of that comprehensive set of early childhood services, really yields a positive return on investment, and we'll talk um, briefly in a minute about why that is. And also because the growth of home visiting has really been grounded in the research base, um, programs are typically focused on that evidence base or using that evidence to inform their program development. And that really means that home visiting programs are using the best of what we know to support families and raise healthy, successful children. Next slide. So here, um, there's some more information on the lasting positive impacts that we have seen as a result of home visiting. Um, the results, as you can see, cross a range of domains for both parents and children. Um, those items on the left are the ones showing positive increases as a result of service, and the ones on the right are elements that decrease as a result of services. So those um, behaviors or outcomes that we hope are reduced, um, in fact, are. And we know that home visitors really impact these outcomes by delivering information through a trusting relationship that helps mothers and fathers better understand and support their infant's development. And that trusting relationship that's developed really um, is a mechanism that helps parents learn how to provide responsive nurturing care and a safe, stimulating environment for their children. And home visitors also promote parents' own responsibility and self-efficacy by working with them to improve their own education, um, find employment, 
and build stronger, more stable relationships with those supportive people in their lives. Next slide. So here, um, this slide really explains why the early period is such a critical period and why investments during this period can have such positive returns. Um, there's truly no other opportunity across any person's life to have this kind of impact, and that's because of the brain development that's happening during this period. Um, we really are learning more about brain development every year, and the re research really just continues to get stronger, supporting this concept that early intervention is, is the time. Um, we know that neural circuits uh, create the foundation for learning, behavior, being in relationship, mental health, and physical health across the lifespan. And these neural networks are being developed at the greatest rate and are also the most flexible during the first three, three years of life. Um, over time, they really um, become more concrete and increasingly difficult to change. So that alone um, kind of demonstrates that it makes sense that getting things um, laid down and, and set up from the beginning is just much more cost effective and preventive and actually protective, um, leading to a lifetime's worth of better outcomes. We also know that persistent toxic stress, such as extreme poverty, abuse and neglect, or severe maternal depression can actually damage a child's developing brain, doing the opposite. So that, in those cases, um, those experiences can really lead to lifelong problems in learning behavior and mental or physical health. So we know the brain is strengthened by positive early experiences, especially stable relationships with caring and responsive adults, safe and supportive environments, and those are exactly the aims that home visitors are working to impact with families. Next slide. So the final key factor is that um, evidence base, which is so foundational to home visiting. Um, and this is significant because it really ensures that we are using what we know to help children grow to their fullest potential. When we use the evidence to make decisions about the services we provide, we're holding ourselves to a high standard of accountability. And this includes paying attention to how programs are implemented and committing to continuous learning about how these services work and staying true to the program intent. Now, this also ensures that families are getting the intervention that was shown to be successful. So it's not only being accountable for the resources expended, but also being accountable to parents. Um, parents come to home visiting because they want to grow, learn, and develop stronger capacity to meet their children's needs. And for those of us working in the field, keeping their desires in focus is so important. And with that, I'm going to um, turn this over to Debbie, who can talk much more specifically about the home visiting landscape in Alaska. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. My name is Debbie Baldwin. I'm the Child Development Division Director at Rural CAP, and we uh, provide home visiting services to families prenatal uh, to age five. Uh, across 23 communities in Alaska, we serve about 350 families in various early childhood family support programs. And it's a pleasure to be here to share a little bit about what we know about home visiting across Alaska. Over the past two decades in Alaska, public policymakers and stakeholders alike have confirmed the importance of the early years as critical years in a child's life. Official reports issued from previous state task force groups, education summits, and health advisory groups have all confirmed that Alaska families with young children would benefit greatly from voluntary access to high quality early childhood and family support programs. It is important that these programs be offered both in and out of the home environment. From Governor Tony Knowles in the late 1990s to our current Governor Bill Walker, 
Each administration has explored the opportunity to further invest in families with young children. The need for in-home options supporting families is articulated in several public documents here in the state of Alaska. The 1998 Early Years Critical Years Report, the 2006 Ready to Read, Ready to Learn Task Force recommendations, and the 2012 Alaska Early Childhood Coordinating Council Strategic Report. Even though the evidence is compelling and the recommendations unwavering, Alaska has not made significant progress in making this an option for more families. Federal funds supporting, thank you. Federal funds supporting some of the earliest home visiting pro programs in Alaska, such as Head Start, Even Start, and the Federal Parent and Child Program. The Parent and Child Program ultimately transitioned into the Federal Early Head Start Program in 1997. Healthy Families programs were also operating in a few communities, along with a couple of other locally designed, culturally responsive home visiting programs, like Tumkanka in the lower Kuskokwim area. Some of these legacy programs remain today, and others were but three-year demonstration projects. Federal investment combined with a modest state investment continues to provide limited resources for various home visiting programs as noted on the map. It is my pleasure to have Cheryl um, in the room with us here today uh, who helped create the map that you are viewing um, on the slide. And I'd just like to turn it over to Cheryl to talk a little bit about what the map represents. Thanks, Debbie. Hi, everybody. So um, if you go online, uh, you can go to the state website and then uh, Division of Public Health, which is where the program I work for is housed in the section of women's, children's, and family health. And we set up a home visiting resource uh, network, and you could probably also Google that and pull it up. It'll be in the chat. I'll oh, it'll be, okay, so that'll, yeah. So the web link will be in the chat, so you don't even have to do anything to get the link. So, uh, so I've been contacting folks all over the state trying to do an inventory of all the programs that are um, serving prenatal through up to age five and include some service delivery in people's homes. It doesn't have to be exclusively um, in the home. So for example, what you see on the map there includes uh, parents as teachers, early Head Start, Head Start, and uh, the MedV programs, as well as some others. So, um, please uh, have a look at the map at your leisure, and uh, if you find something that's missing or is incorrect, at the same web page there is a link to my uh, email address. You just hit it, and it'll pull up a little email, and you can say, uh, send me a message uh, and let me know uh, what needs to be fixed. And one thing that I do think is notable is that there's, and I'm sure you see that too, there's parts of the state where we don't have any of the little boxes which represent services of some kind. And uh, I think that's part of what we're talking about here and also looking at preserving all the little boxes that are already there, which is a big part of what we're talking about here. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Cheryl. And I'm happy to say today that we are going to contribute two more diamonds to your map from Rural Cap. Uh, we are just opening a Parents as Teachers program in Barrow um, as we speak, and we just hired a Parents as Teachers parent educator in Huna um, as well. So we continue to hopefully march across the state to add these valuable programs. As Cheryl mentioned, please, if you do not um, have your particular home visiting program represented on the map or you are not aware of home visiting programs that are in your region, please take the time to visit uh, the map um, under, on the state's website. Um, just to continue, um, federal investment through the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Education, Alaska Native Education Program, Enable programs such as Head Start, Early Head Start, Healthy Start, Parents as Teachers, and the Nurse Family Partnership Program 
to offer home visiting services to families who meet the respective eligibility criteria. State investment has resulted in a small, limited expansion of the Parents' as Teachers program and continues to provide state match to support some early Head Start and Head Start home visiting programs. The most recent infusion of funds in Alaska supporting home visiting services has been federal pass-through funds to the state supporting the Maternal Child Health Home Visiting Initiative and the Federal Tribal Home Visiting Initiative. At this time, there is no coordinated, comprehensive public-private funding strategy to meet the increased needs for home visiting services in Alaska, nor is there an investment strategy in place to ensure sustainability for programs currently in operation. Those of us in Alaska know how, how devastating it is to start up programs and close programs down. There's cost to doing that. And I can tell you over the many years that I've been in this field, we have seen far too many programs that have been funded in project funding um, startup, get qualified staff, build relationships with families, and see their funding end at the end of a three-year project period. Hopefully today we're going to find solutions to that. Thank you. Why is home visiting important in Alaska? Home visiting is a model that works across the state. It honors the home environment as the most influential natural learning environment for children. It takes little to no capital investment, such as required by center-based programs. It provides support for families who may feel isolated during the long, cold winter months. It provides highly needed and valuable information on health promotion and prevention, which may not otherwise be readily accessible in communities that have limited access to ongoing preventive care. For those of you who have traveled around the state and have had the pleasure of visiting the local health clinics, you often see, again, the health provider's attention focusing on um, critical and urgent care. Um, we often do not have enough opportunity to have preventive care being provided to the youngest children in our state. And home visiting, again, helps bridge the pathway uh, between families and providers for this. In many communities, it provides support services in the family's first language and incorporates cultural values and traditions. We do have home visiting occurring in our state um, where the uh, Provider is um, providing services in the first language, whether it be Yupik, Inupiaq, Athabascan. We're very excited about um, being able to offer that. Home visiting um, in the prenatal to three years, combined with subsequent enrollment in a high-quality early childhood education program for children ages three to five, consistently show the strongest child and family outcomes in our 50-year history at RoCap. Most home visiting models have a modest annual cost per family when compared to other early childhood programs. Several models offered by trained professionals um, in rural communities, which makes it easily replicable for other uh, rural and remote communities. There are many good reasons why access to high quality home visiting services need to be a social, economic, and educational imperative in Alaska. We are all too familiar with the challenges we face in our state around children's health and well-being. We are also keenly aware of the high cost of trauma and health disparities when addressed later in a child's life. As part of the early childhood community, we are striving to inform parents about the importance of keeping their child's preventative health care up to date. We know that children who may be at risk for developmental delays, if given early support and intervention, can exit out of potential remedial support by kindergarten. We also know that itinerant services, which happens quite a bit across our state, when partnered with weekly home visiting services, provide a continuity of support that itinerant services alone cannot provide. And we know that helping parents understand brain development and positive guidance and discipline can reduce the stressors in the home environment ultimately leading to a reduction in potential incidence of maltreatment and neglect. We also know in the early childhood and health community that providing families with early literacy enrichment strategies and materials goes a long way, way in helping parents get their child ready for kindergarten. But most importantly, we know that developing a mutually respectful, 
responsive relationship with a parent in support of their child's education and development ultimately builds confidence in a parent's to assume the most important role for their family, and that role is being the best and most important advocate for their child. Please join the early child and health community in addressing sustainability for home visiting programs in Alaska. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. We will now move to the next segment in our early part of the summit and we'll talk about sustainability opportunities. And I will turn um, the microphone over to Anthony, who will provide an introduction to our next speaker. for the presentation. It uh, made me think about, um, you know, there's a lack of infrastructure in a lot of the villages, and the center-based programs are awesome, but most villages can't afford the centers. So this, this type of strategy is critical in, in a lot of those cases. Um, so this segment, we're going to be talking about sustainability opportunities, and we've lined up several different speakers that um, have different types of resources. Um, and that was kind of the goal, is to look at maybe resources that we haven't looked at before. Um, our first speaker is going to be Trevor Storrs. Um, Trevor's been a member of the Alaska community for 19 years. He's the executive, executive director of the Alaska Children's Trust. And we're really fortunate to have him this morning because he's literally on the road um, he's called in, and he's going to give a, a brief uh, uh, sort of a, sort of lay the, the framework for some of the funding challenges that we're faced with and some of the need for advocacy. So, Trevor, uh, uh, you're up. Oh, and hit star six if you're muted. Good morning. You can hear me now? Yes. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. As it was mentioned, I'm with the Alaska Children's Trust, and we are focused on the prevention of child abuse and neglect. We are a funding agent in our state, and we fund various programs that are focused in on that goal of preventing child abuse and neglect. And we actively support uh, home visiting uh, programs, unfortunately not in direct funding at this time. We are a very small funding agent. We uh, currently have been giving small grants around $10,000 for projects, and we would definitely encourage people that are doing home visiting to be able to look at those as well and you can go to our website. But specifically, I was asked to kind of talk about uh, potential funding opportunities or the challenges that we are faced in Alaska. As we all know, in Alaska, we are dealing with a deficit, and funding is uh, part of the conversation and a struggle across the state. And when we're looking at this funding, more and more governments or people are suggesting to look at the nonprofit sector and specifically philanthropy as a way of filling in the very large gaps that are starting to develop. As I mentioned, we're a small trust, and for us to be able to fill that gap, we have a $12 million deficit. I mean, my apologies, $12 million endowment. And that allows us approximately a half a million dollars a year that allows us to do administrative work as well as doing that granting. Uh, half a million dollars is a very small drop in a very large bucket of need, especially when we're looking at home visiting programs. And when we also look at other funding organizations, if we look at our top uh, three that are public, out in the community, Rasmussen, the Mental Health Trust Authority, and the Matsu Health Foundation. And actually the fourth, um, a little bit, would be the Alaska Community Foundation, but they are made up of multiple organizations or funding agents. The One of the strongest issues that we have in our state is most of our funders support uh, initially for projects, doing some matching, 
but most of them do not do ongoing funding for programs. And as we know with the home visiting, it's not a, a one-time program, and we continually have uh, new people coming through the program because we have new parents. So we are always faced with that struggle. And even within the Children's Trust, we're not really set up with our level of funding to be able to do continual funding year after year for the same projects. And I think that is a challenge that we are faced at within our state is one limited number of funders, uh, but also the focus of those funders and the ability to continually do the ongoing funding. Although each one of them does outstanding work, it's just the struggle that we have as programs uh, and to find that funding. Probably the greatest funder, uh, is our state, and I think that's where it really comes into our advocacy work. With all the information that has been shared on the home visiting programs and truly the impact that they have, what we're getting to is working with our most vulnerable populations that are the greatest risk of potentially accessing the current services that our state provides, which is Medicaid, the correctional system, uh, special education, and you see what I'm talking about is individuals going and becoming an expense to our state, most likely due to the fact of the trauma that they will experience as a child because families are living in poverty, don't have access to certain resources and the supports that are needed like home visiting programs. And our advocacy really needs to be focused in on how do we get the state to understand the greatest investment of our dollar is not at the end point, the triage of the issue, but truly the prevention of it. We know that there's a national acclaimed economist who received the Nobel Prize, uh, Heckman, that shows that if we invest in those early stages like home visiting, for every dollar we get $7 back versus when we wait to invest into our children after the age of 18, you know, at those early stages, again, workforce development skills, we barely, if at all, get a dollar-for-dollar dollar match uh, return. And it's really important that we start advocating with our legislators, especially as November 8th is coming up and who we select to be in our legislature, as well as for the future of really helping them understand that we, as not just programs, but can constituents and members of our great community of Alaska, that we want that development, uh, that investment in the prevention side. And as we start looking at cost savings, that we do not sacrifice that investment. Just last year, we saw the uh, home visiting uh, parents as uh, teachers program once again on the chopping block, and it was saved. They were continually, rather than working towards developing and strengthening programs, we're continually having to protect them. Uh, and it's almost like a domestic violence relationship at times because we're continually in fear of what's going to happen next versus that true partnership of that prevention uh, side of it. Um, and I believe I'm just coming up to my uh, 10 minutes. Uh, so I encourage us as organizations to really start looking at how do we band together and do that advocacy work, but also how do we come together and start having that discussion. As one of the presenters mentioned, we have uh, no private pub public funding plan, and maybe coming together and start having that discussion and doing that deep dive, because with that plan, maybe that would also support the investment on the state so the state doesn't see it as a sole responsibility of theirs, as well as the public side, I should say the private investors, foundations, don't see that the government is just relying on us to do that work as well, really building that relationship and that foundation. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Trevor. We really appreciate you taking the time out uh, while you're on the road to share with us your perspectives. Um, My pleasure. Uh, did anybody have questions? Are we doing that? Or uh, if not, I will be stepping away because I do have to continue on with my meetings here in San Antonio.
Yeah, we're, we're reserving the questions for the discussions at the tail end. So um, we, we have uh, your contact information that we're sharing. Um, so we appreciate it very much. Well, my pleasure, and hopefully it wasn't uh, feeling too bleak in the sense of funding. Uh, there are great opportunities for partnerships, and there's vast opportunity in the sense of advocacy. It won't be easy work, but it would be very fruitful work if we do work towards that. And, again, thank you very much for your time and allowing me to share my perspective. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next presentation is actually uh, my own. I'm going to keep it very short because we're a little bit behind schedule here. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm the Regional Director for the Alaska Region Training and Technical Assistance Center, and we are a resource to the Administration for Native Americans. Um, we, we provide support to the ANA grantee portfolio in Alaska. We have more than 20 projects right now funded around the state. Uh, we've been really focused on expanding uh, the reach of those of those dollars to areas that have been underserved uh, or that haven't received grants um, in the past and um, trying to get our training out to different parts of the state um, so that uh, yeah, to, to broaden the reach of, of the funds and also the, the expertise that we have. Um, So we have we have a staff of actually four. Well, we have myself. Uh, we have a training manager, technical assistance manager, Charles Peel, um, our outreach and technology spell specialist, and we have our project support and technology uh, uh, specialist uh, Micah as well. So we've got a full team here in Alaska providing assistance to uh, Native organizations here in Alaska. Um, it's somewhat unique with the Administration for Native Americans because. Uh, we serve not only Alaska Native organizations, but also Pacific Islander organizations uh, as well, although we don't currently have any, any grants uh, in, the, in the Pacific Islander community. Um, some of the things that we provide is uh, free resources. We, we collaborate with all the other regions, Pacific, Western, Eastern, uh, to develop tools and templates and webinars on different aspects, including sustainability. We've done a couple of of webinars on sustainability, and uh, these are available on the national ANA website, um, and we have links to that from our regional website. So for Alaska, it's anaalaska.org. Uh, that's where you can go to find out more about our, our services, um, how to sign up for our trainings, um, how to get technical assistance on your on your uh, projects, um, and I'll just briefly go over our technical assistance. Our, the type of training that we do is project development training. This is really for any type of project, any type of funding. It's a three-day workshop that we that we do. Um, we also do pre-application training. We should be having pre-app trainings for new a and funding that's coming out uh, for 2017. Those trainings will be happening in January. And then for our grantees, we do post-award training. For those of you that are developing your projects and your applications, um, I'm going to jump ahead here, but on your applications for ANA funds, we provide pre-app review of those applications. Uh, we have a team of, of consultants on our staff that can do that can review your 75% rough draft application and uh, help you to strengthen your proposals. You can apply for that on our website as well. And for those that weren't funded this fall. We're also available to review the comments that you got on your applications and provide some pointers on how to strengthen your proposals. So the core funding that ANA provides, uh, there's different, three different programmatic areas, social and economic development strategies, uh, and language and preservation, or language preservation and maintenance, as well as environmental, environmental regulatory enhancement. And the ones that are applicable to the home visiting model is the SEDS, the SEDS funding, which in Alaska we have uh, what's called the Alaska SEDS, which is a, a pot of funds that are uh, targeted for Alaskan organizations, that, particularly for village-based projects. Um, the funding cap is slightly lower than the national SEDS, and um, I think this year we funded about six, 
six Alaska SEDS projects. So, uh, like we heard the first speaker say, our projects, we fund projects. Uh, we don't fund uh, ongoing, ongoing program operations. That's typically a challenge that a lot of organizations are faced with. Um, but we do fund, we can fund development of aspects of the program. Uh, it's very flexible funding. It's basically what the community's priorities are. Um, the early childhood component, the first language, native instruction, um, our language programs, our language resources could be useful for that. Um, our Esther Martinez immersion program is specifically for language nests, targeting uh, from early years on up. Um, so it's just a, a little bit about our resources. And uh, we funded, uh, like I said, six SES projects, um, several language grants this year. It's pretty exciting. And uh, we're now in the process of reaching out to those organizations. So that's just a quick uh, introduction to the TA Center um, and a little bit about our ANA resources. Um, please reach out to us at anaalaska.org. We'd be happy to talk to you about your project idea, your project concepts, and uh, we hope to see you in our pre-op trainings in January for funding for 2017. So, thanks. Our next speaker is Pam Miller. She's the Executive Director for the Alaska Community Action on Toxics. And um, just real briefly, uh, She's got a long history in the state. Um, since 2000, ACAT has been awarded multiple federal grants, which Pam has been serving as team leader on from 2005 to 2016 as the principal investigator um, of a research team that includes faculty from four universities in Alaska and New York. And uh, as she's speaking, you can read a little bit more about her bio. Um, I'd like to go ahead and give the floor to Pam, Pamela Miller. Thank you for joining us. Um, you might need to hit star six um, to go ahead and to proceed. Yeah. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Great, very good. Well, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. And just a little bit about our organization, Alaska Community Action on Topics is a nonprofit environmental health research and advocacy organization. We conduct community-based participatory research. We undertake policy initiatives, and we also do a lot of educational and outreach programs in science and environmental health and provide practical approaches to reducing harmful exposures in the home, school, work, and at the community level. We're quite concerned that developing children, pregnant women, infants, children, are especially vulnerable to being exposed to even small amounts of toxic substances during important times of development, and that this can lead to disease early in life, later in life, or even across generations. It's very well established now in the scientific literature that many toxic chemicals can interfere with healthy brain development some at extremely low levels of exposure. Research in the neurosciences has identified critical windows of vulnerability during embryonic and fetal development, infancy, early childhood, and adolescence. And during these windows of development, toxic chemical exposures may cause lasting harm to the brain that interferes with a child's ability to reach his or her full potential. Children today are really at an unacceptably high risk of developing neurodevelopmental disorders that affect their brains and nervous system, and these include autism, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, intellectual disabilities, and other learning and behavioral disabilities. And we know that these are complex disorders with multiple causes, including genetic, social, and environmental. But the, tox the contribution of toxic chemicals to these disorders can definitely be prevented. Recently, a leading group of scientific and medical experts and children's health advocates came together <clears throat> under the auspices of Project TENDER, which stands for Targeting Environmental Neurodevelopmental Risks, to issue a call to action to reduce widespread exposures to chemicals 
that interfere with children's brain development. And based on the available scientific evidence, the tender authors have identified prime examples of toxic chemicals and pollutants that increase children's risk for neurodevelopmental disorders. These include chemicals that are used extensively in consumer products and that have become widespread in the environment. Some are chemicals to which children and pregnant women are regularly exposed, and they are now detected in the bodies of virtually all Americans in national surveys conducted by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we believe that children in Alaska may be more highly exposed. The vast majority of chemicals in industrial and consumer products undergo almost no testing for developmental neurotoxicity or other health effects. So to help reduce these unacceptably high uh, prevalence of neurodevelopmental disorders in our children, we must eliminate or significantly reduce exposures to chemicals that contribute to these conditions. And we believe that Early interventions and policy measures are very urgently needed if we are to protect healthy brain development so that current and future generations can reach their full potential. So where does ACOPAC come into all of this? We were one of the participants in the tender process and authors of this paper that was published in the peer-reviewed journal called Environmental Health Perspective. So, Recognizing the vulnerability of pregnant women and children to the toxic effects of chemical exposures in our homes, waters, and foods, and the importance of educating parents about ways to prevent harmful exposures and protect health. ACAS provides workshops, trainings, and these can range from trainings for healthcare professionals, parents, and teachers about how toxic chemicals can affect prenatal <coughs> through um, early childhood development, and then especially focusing on ways that we can work together to prevent and avoid exposures to these common substances in everyday life that can be harmful to the health of developing children. So we offer workshops and training. We recently, in early October, held a major children's environmental health summit, and the proceedings and recommendations will soon come out about that. We also offer monthly teleconference seminars that feature science and policy experts from around the state and country uh, as part of our Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment. And then we also work to develop collaborative relationships to focus on policy uh, changes that could offer protection for uh, our vulnerable children. So, for instance, we are advocating for a, a legislation called the Toxic Free Children's Act, which would focus on toxic chemicals found regularly in children's toys and in our homes and in furniture and, and products um, such as electronics. So that's just a little bit about who we are and what we do, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Pam, what's your website? Did I miss that? Sure. It's www.akaction.org. And we do have a number of resources there, including fact sheets and reports. Um, that's how you can sign up to participate in the Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment. So we welcome every, everyone to visit our website and also to call our office if you'd like more information or if you'd like to find out more about our training programs. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Pam. We appreciate you sharing about ACAT, and um, thanks for for taking the the time out to do that. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Very glad to be a part of the discussion. Okay. Um, our next presenter is Jeff Baird. Jeff Baird is the program officer for the Rasmussen Foundation. And um, he's going to present a little bit about uh, some of the resources that Rasmussen uh, provides uh, here in Alaska. So, Jeff? Hi, everyone. Thanks, Anthony, for letting us be part of this. Um, the, my goal today is just to pr provide a, a brief overview of our two main grant programs, uh, the foundations involved in, in other um, initiatives that it, 
it works on as well. And that, to find more information on that, you can, you can go to our website. But these are programs that uh, people can apply for, the, the two I'm going to be talking about today. Um, just before I start, the Rasmussen Fam Foundation was started by the Rasmussen family. They grew National Bank, Bank of Alaska into the largest bank of the state before selling to Wells Fargo in 2000 to focus on philanthropy. And Anthony, I'm changing slides here, correct? Okay. Um, I, just tell me to advance and I'll do it for you. Okay, sure. So we fund... Uh, Alaska-based nonprofits, tribes, and cities with a year's plus financials, and we have two main grant programs. Next slide, please. Our Tier 1 grant program and Tier 2 grant program. Um, next slide. Our Tier 1 grant program are grants up to $25,000. There's no deadline. A person can apply any time. Our application's online. This is our really how an organization starts a relationship with the foundation. Um, if you receive a war, uh, if your request is approved, you get a check within 90 days um, along with a grant agreement. It's, it's really supposed to be how an organization learns about kind of the most the things that we think are important um, and it's us us to get to know a little bit about you and you get to know a little bit about us, this is where I'd start if you're looking to to um, start a relationship with the foundation. What In terms of what we fund, we're primarily a capital funder. We absolutely do not fund operating expenses in this grant program. Uh, so we provide grants for infrastructure, a nonprofit uh, uses to do its work. So um, that can look like anything from um, vehicles to um, we help fund libraries throughout the state, community spaces, um, items for, and equipment for uh, cultural programs, things like that. Next slide, please. So our other grant programs are Tier 2 grant. It's anything above $25,000, and this is a little, uh, it's a little more formal. So. Unlike the Tier 1 grant where you can apply at any time, you just go to our website, you actually have to be invited to apply for a Tier 2 grant. Um, that starts with a letter of inquiry. Um, if, if the foundation thinks it might be interested in the project, then you're invited to submit a full proposal. Uh, all Tier 2 grants ultimately have to be approved by our board of directors, which meets twice a year. And um, essentially, the key to the uh, Tier 2 program is you want to contact staff, call them, talk them about uh, what you're thinking. Um, we, we appreciate this. We really want an organization to have a positive experience. So while well, we might not be able to um, guarantee a, a successful outcome, we will talk to you about your program uh, or your, your grant idea and um, tell you what we think about it. And you should go into the process knowing the strengths and potential weaknesses of an application. So we don't want you to feel burned by the experience. We want you to go in uh, kind of eyes wide open at what uh, the process should look, should look like. And that will start with a phone call. Um, next slide, please. So basics, um, go to our website, www.rasmussen.org. You can call myself or any of uh, our other program officers to discuss your project. Again, our, our materials are available online and under our grants um, tab at the top of our website. If you could scroll down, please, or next slide. Um, just a couple broad things to think about when applying. Uh, we like shovel-ready projects, so especially for the Tier 1 grant program, we want the project to be completed within about a year, and most of our Tier 1s are going to be uh, your be projects that can be done within a year. Um, sometimes the Tier 2s vary a little bit, but either way, we want them to be shovel-ready. Uh, for nonprofits, we want we expect 100% board giving, um, so that's just a contribution to the uh, by the board to the organi organization. It doesn't have to be to the specific project. But um, and also regarding board giving, it doesn't have to be a specific amount. It just has to be a meaningful amount to that individual. And obviously, people have different 
circumstances, so whatever is meaningful to that individual. We don't like to be the sole funder. This is especially uh, important in our larger grant programs. So oftentimes we're just a leverage funder. In fact, right now for our tier two grants, which again are anything over $25,000, the letter of inquiry, we're not, uh, we're recommending you don't even submit a letter of inquiry until you have 50% of a project cost cash in hand. So um, multiple funding sources are very important, especially in, in this um, economy. And, um, you know, if, if an organization can demonstrate broad partnerships with other organizations uh, as a way of kind of maximizing a project impact, that's, that's also really helpful in applications. Next slide, please. So, our, again, this is our website, raspison.org, the um, grants tab up. At the top of our screen, you'll find uh, more information about our Tier 1 and Tier 2 grant programs. The tab next to that is initiatives. This is other work the foundation does. Um, usually it's initiatives because the foundation initiated, initiates it. It's not something you can apply for, but the foundation is involved in a variety of um, other things from alcohol recovery to dental health. So um, that's other work that we do, but again, it's not directly tied to our grant programs. Next slide. So again, the main point, if you have any sort of questions, just give us a call. We want to be uh, helpful. We want to talk about projects before people apply again so we can help inform their application and um, help people have a, as pleasant as possible uh, experience. So thanks again, Anthony, for uh, letting us be a part of this. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff, and thank you, uh, Rasmussen Foundation, for the tremendous support around the state. Uh, I've seen a lot of your projects. Uh, uh, it's just phenomenal what you've done here in Alaska. Um, so thank you. Thanks, Anthony. Okay, our last uh, sustainability opportunities presenter is is Tamar Ben Yosef. She's the executive director of the Alaska Pediatric Pediatric Partnership, and I'm just going to let her go straight in because we are a little bit behind. So, if you want to come over here, oh, oh can I, or, can I get well, here? we'll need to move this over. Oh, okay. Let's make sure we. All right. Um, thank you, Patricia, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share with you guys. I apologize if some of you already heard some of this information. We've been kind of talking about it over the last couple of years around the state, so there may be some duplication. Um, so over the last few years, a few agencies and individuals in Alaska have been um, successfully moving the needle on the weight place on infant and early childhood mental health. Um, I only have a few minutes, so this is just going to be a quick snippet of a larger presentation that we normally do. Um, as you all are well aware, for a really long time, too long, there's been a strong emphasis on addressing the problems after they occur, after the fact, um, after they are already are problems. And today, thanks to research that's happening nationwide and, and here in Alaska, um, we're approaching health of our population with prevention in mind. Um, so, not news to you guys, um, Alaska has one of the highest rates in the U.S., of sexual abuse and neglect. Our state also experiences high rates of suicide, alcoholism, drug abuse, developmental disabilities, and homelessness. Um, jumping into the ACEs study, um, just a quick review in case someone had not heard about it. Um, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study conducted by Kaiser Permanente and the CDC in 1995 were a big eye-opener for everyone, um, from providers to educators to really anyone. Some of, it is, some of the findings are intuitive, but, but the connections to some outcomes like suicide, stress-related heart, heart attacks, that's something that anyone might guess that trauma is related to, but some, uh, many others were not, like asthma, osteoarthritis, um, and the list is long. Um, until this study came out and its overwhelming results were widely spread, um, people didn't make those connections as they are today. Um, since its release, 
the study has served and continues to serve as an instrumental resource for advocacy and efforts to bring changes to policy and approaches to education and health across the U.S. and at the Alaska Pediatric Partnership, that is um, a lot of the work that we've been doing. So jumping into the research, um, in 2013, um, with growing knowledge about ACEs and their effects on people's health, the Alaska Mental Health Board uh, sought to quantify the ACEs in Alaska's adult population. Uh, Pat Sidmore, who's a planner for the Alaska Mental Health Board Advisory Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse and an expert on all things ACEs and data, <laughs> conducted a two-year survey among more than 4,000 Alaskan adults, including Alaska's indigenous population. And the survey was conducted as part of the BRFIS, the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System Survey. Um, not surprising, what Pat found was that Alaska's ACEs scores were significantly higher compared with other U.S. states where similar surveys were conducted. Uh, with those, these results, he shifted the focus to increasing, we shifted everyone who's been working around prevention of child abuse and neglect in Alaska, kind of shifted um, the focus to increasing awareness and sense of urgency for action and wanted to translate this knowledge into practical methods that we could use to reduce the occurrence of ACEs among Alaskans, infants, and children, particularly within the Alaska Native communities where ACE scores are the highest. Um, so this next slide is um, basically, without going into brain development, we know that investing in the first years of a child's life provides the best return on investment and savings later on. It comes down to prevention versus intervention. Just another um, slide. Uh, Nobel laureate Gene Heckman did a lot of research on this and calculated that early investment has around a 7 to 10 percent um, return on investment. And um, uh, obviously, the more we spend on the kids now preventing the problems, the less we'll spend on them in the future. So, what do we do with that? With that knowledge, um, because many of the states we um, have conducted the same survey of populations rate on ACEs that we've done, we have a lot of data sources to draw from. And when I say we, um, <laughs> we work a lot with Pat, but this is really Pat's, Pat's data that we share with him <laughs> statewide. Um, in Alaska, we tried to find a couple of states that had a better rate of ACEs than Alaska does um, and needed to see what it would take to get to that level. So after exploring the data that was collected from all the states, Vermont and Arkansas had ACEs scores that were better than Alaska's, and, um, and, but not too far-fetched for us to, to try and drive for, too. So we wanted to see what would happen if we dropped, um, if half the people with one ACE dropped to zero ACEs and the other half stayed at one. Um, or half the people with two ACEs dropped to one ACE and the other stayed at two. Or another way of looking at it is if all the population's calculated ACEs score dropped by half an ACE. And we looked at, um, at costs for these sample conditions, and I'll only go over a couple of them because we don't have time to go through all, but obesity, adult Medicaid recipients, smoking, binge drinking, diabetes, and arthritis, were the ones that he looked at. So, for example, um, if we drop by half an eighth, the cost, the savings for adult Medicaid usage would be about $38.7 million annually. Looking at adult binge drinking, a reduction of about $10.5 million annually. Um, adults with arthritis, a savings of $9.1 million annually. And this is, um, this is kind of looking at all those conditions that I mentioned earlier. Alaska would save, by reducing half an ACE, would save more than $90 million annually. And that's just looking at these conditions, so not looking at any other conditions that are related to ACEs or could be um, addressed by preventing rather than intervention intervention. So just a little snippet of what $90 million can buy in Alaska, uh, 258 three-bedroom homes in Anchorage, 915 kindergarten teachers, 846 police officers, 
nearly 340 pediatricians, um, the general funds for the Department of Commerce, Community, and Economic Development, and Department of Labor and Workforce Development, and uh, 103,307 flights from Ketchikan to Barrow in July, or the entire Boeing, plus $17 million for fuel and a crew. Um, so that's really that's a really quick snippet, just to give you an idea of some of the work that has been done around kind of uh, looking at the economics of ACEs. Um, we work with providers to um, teach them about ACEs because while it seems to be really growing, there's still people out there that have not necessarily heard about it or don't know the extent of um, of the research that is happening around this now. Um, and for us at A2P2, a lot of the emphasis is on screening and incorporating trauma-informed approaches into the practices. Um, and um, there's a lot of work happening with the school districts trying to incorporate trauma-informed practices into the schools in Alaska. We work closely with the Alaska Children's Trust with Trevor on um, uh, the Alaska Resilience Initiative, and um, there's a lot happening in the state. But but the bottom line is, uh, knowing this this data about the economics shows obviously that we have to change the focus from uh, not take away funds from from youth, obviously, but really put more funds into the beginning. And, and home visiting is a is a big part of that is really kind of getting to the parents where they're at. So. Thanks for the opportunity and stuff, right? Thank you. And here is uh, Tamara's contact information um, and her phone number. <laughs> Yeah, so before we go to the next segment on our actual discussion, uh, we're going to be setting up some discussion groups. Um, we want to check. We're about 15 minutes behind schedule. Uh, we planned on wrapping this up at 11.30. Uh, we want to do a quick poll and see if everybody is okay if we go to 11.45. So if you could either in the chat box uh, say yes, yes or no, um, or... Uh, use the little yes or no thumbs up, uh, and if you, if you could do that right now, just let us know. If <coughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. So the question is, uh, can we go to 11:45? Is everybody on board with that? Well, yeses. Um, Otherwise, we'll have to compress our discussion groups. So we're we're going to decide here. Okay. In general, we're getting yeses. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to extend it till 11:45. I apologize, Pam. Uh, I know you got to leave 11:30. Um, but uh, we're going to we're going to assume 11:45. So that'll set the stage for the next segment here, and I'm going to let uh, Petra do the introduction and proceed with this portion. Thank you. Thank you for all of the great presentations today um, and providing us information about how other organizations can support home visiting. The next portion of the program is really what we're hoping to be the really, <coughs> my apologies, the really beginning stages of a much larger and ongoing conversation in Alaska about uh, increasing sustainability or supporting home visiting programs in the state. We wish we had some unlimited time today to do that discussion, but unfortunately we do not. 
And um, hopefully, our hope for today and the goal for today's discussion is to develop two or three um, next action steps that the group will continue to get engaged around. Um, so the way we will do it at this, um, at this stage is that we will break into discussion groups. I have to navigate to an, another screen for just a, just a moment. Oops. I'll make this bigger. So the way we will do this, we will break into three breakout groups. And on your screen, you see the configuration of the three breakout groups. If your name is in breakout group one and you are on the phone instead and were not able to join us in the room today, please choose one of the two other breakout groups, breakout group, group two or breakout group three. We have a designated facilitator and note taker for each one of those groups that will join you in that call. And when we're ready to do this, please press star one on your phone to join the sub-meeting, and then press pound two on your phone uh, to press uh, to join sub-meeting group uh, three. And when you're finished with your discussion, I will rejoin you in the main room and we will have a shared discussion about your major points of discussion during the group, and we will also consolidate your ideas for next steps, and uh, we'll vote on what pieces of, or what strategies you would like to move forward with. So now I have the privilege of introducing our main facilitator, who will, who will join us to um, at the later portion of the um, breakout groups and will lead a discussion with a large group. Barbara is the Assistant Director for Public Policy at Zero to Three, and we're privileged to have her join us this morning. Barbara will provide a few opening comments. Thank you, Petra. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Gabhard, and I bring you greetings uh, from West Virginia. We like to think of ourselves as rural, but it, it compares nothing to uh, the rural nature of Alaska. Uh, so this afternoon, as Petra said, we're going to spend a little bit of time in the three groups uh, around two different discussion points. Uh, one is around what strategies we might be able to, to brainstorm to leverage either new or existing funding or other partnership and resource opportunities. So that, as um, was described earlier, is really the, the heart of sustainability. And then secondly, um, we will talk a little bit about what strategies would help in building a stronger home visiting system in Alaska. So these are, are somewhat similar in content. They, the ideas might uh, flow a little bit between the two. Uh, but I just wanted to remind you to uh, think about sustainability in a broad way. You know, we tend to think about it as just money. Uh, but it also is other resources, opportunities for collaboration. You've heard from a number of uh, speakers this afternoon that might offer some opportunities for working more closely together, uh, possibly some champions that could be cultivated in Alaska, or other considerations that are specific to Alaska's context. So this is a really a time for us to think a little bit creatively, do some brainstorming, and really remember that broader definition of sustainability. 
And as Patron mentioned, our goal is really for each group to come up with at least a couple of major actions or strategies for moving forward. And we're going to collect those when we come back as a large group and talk about them. Um, so we will um, spend some time in the group doing just really quick introductions, um, have one person uh, volunteer, hopefully, to report back out at uh, the end of our time together. And then uh, we have assigned a note taker who will take notes on these topics. And you can see on the screen um, the, the template that they can use to take um, notes in. Uh, so we have changed our times a little bit. So, Petra, I was just going to ask you what time you wanted to reconvene in the main room. That's a great question, Barbara. We'll reconvene in the main room at 11.30, and then we'll take 11.30 to 11.45 to share out our ideas and then consolidate those ideas about next, next major actions uh, items. Um, and then Anthony will provide a closing thereafter. So I want to thank, first of all, Barbara Yu for also facilitating a subgroup meeting in that discussion in, that, in subgroup meeting two. And then want to thank Maria Gale for leading the discussion in subgroup three. And as uh, Barbara mentioned, um, we have note takers who will actually sign into this Google document so you can see the live notes as they are being taken and as the discussion is taking place. So I will now move you to your designated, uh, I will now uh, put you into subgroups, uh, in the subgroup. Um, I will open the subgroups. And again, if you're in subgroup one, please push pound, I'm sorry, subgroup two. If you're in subgroup two or breakout group two, please push pound one. And if you are in subgroup three, please push pound three. We'll open those discussions. We will I'll open those instructions. Oh, my apologies. I'm in the wrong place. Okay, so I think this is your cue to uh, press that on your phone. If you have any questions, um, you can stay on the line for a minute, and Petra will answer. And you can see which group you're in uh, by looking there on the screen. So we'll reconvene in a half an hour. I will open the subgroup meeting rooms now. To set up or join a sub-meeting, press the pound or hash key followed by any number 1 through 9. To rejoin the main meeting, press the pound or hash key twice. To cancel sub-meetings, press the pound or hash key and zero. So I'm just doing a check to see if anyone is left on the main line. Please announce yourself if you are left on the main line. Hi, Petra. This is for you long. I, this is for Bike Breaker. It was on site, and I'm not on site. So do you just want me to join one of the other groups? Yeah, phone? if you want to just join um, subgroup or breakout group two, you push uh, pound one. Okay, I'm going to do that. I just want to let Thank you for letting me know. All right, thanks. Anyone else left on the main line? Okay. Okay, so I think um, we will start our discussion. Uh, before we start, though, Micah, can I ask you maybe just to call in really quick and check in and, and Room one and two, and make sure they're all okay. Um, do you remember my login? Yes, I do. The eight at the end to make sure that you can actually. Um, so if you push pound one and then pound pound to get you back. And then you're ready to take notes. Should I should I do it? I'm okay with doing it. No worries. I see the other ones in the room already. This is kind of fun to do. <laughs> well, thank you for staying for this portion of the discussion. I think we had a really great start. 
um, and great information you have shared. Um, so I wanted to open our discussion in the room today and see what kind of ideas that you have for, and we'll just combine both of those discussion questions in one if you want to, um, to see what kind of ideas you have for leveraging new and existing funding, partnerships and resource opportunities, or ideas for building a stronger home visiting system in Alaska. Do Direct care positions? Yeah, some kind of like home visiting teacher positions, something like that. Because every child, if you go to the village, they have a baby for me. And if they just, you know, invest 10% of the returns after doing the interest, that, that money is moving towards that program. That's a good idea. And that would resolve, like, ongoing. Are there people online as well? Yeah. Not for us. Oh, not yeah, for us. No. Okay. They're in the we're, we're group group one. Oh, work group one. Oh, yeah. so are you, so I can speak for you. So are you from Quinnahawk? Yeah. Fabulous. What is out there right now? Is ABCP in Quinnahawk? Can oh, I just ask her? Yes. ABCP runs the Head Start there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there a zero to three program, prenatal to three program? I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. 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 We just, um, when I entered WorldCap, we used to get proceeds from bingo operations in several communities, and then our parents got together, and there was a period of years where there were some challenges out in communities, and parents asked us whether they thought promoting evening events away from families would be the right fit, um, you know, for supporting our services. So I, I know it works well in some communities to have gaming proceeds, and I know that um, tribes in other communities have um, shared that. Again, parents prefer that we don't be the recipients of gaming um, proceeds. But I know Metla Catla is very successful at it. They have a casino the only casino here in Alaska as an Alaska Indian um, reservation. And I know they do not um, draw down, as far as I know, um, state Head Start funds or very little because they're able to use the local proceeds. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Yeah. Something along the same lines, we just had the opportunity to get a commitment up north on the North Slope Borough um, from a trilateral group um, in New Wixit around dedication of mitigation funds from using the oil. Um, uh, starting January, they're going to be dedicating, you know, a small percentage but a significant to a local child care center uh, to help with operations to make the cost of the child care center affordable. Home visiting is next because, again, recognizing that not all families need or want their child in a formal center environment. But that's another creative solution. How do we get into the sort of, um, you know, private mm -hmm. resources that... You know, um, Anthony, this is the challenge. We are all based in project funding. And, um, you know, it's, it's originally the intent is good, set up promising practices, best practices, then market it out or see if you can replicate it through other sort of, um, 
you know, sustainable funding. But there is very little program funding out there, and so this constant startup and, you know, close down of programs based on their competitive edge in the next round of um, is just, uh, as I well, shared with you, just... My wife and I talked to Bob. She was a home visitor to preschool. Oh, yeah. And, and Matt, too. Mm -hmm. And they, same yep, same thing, thing with them. And she says that was the best job I ever had. And if she could continue to do it, she would, because she loved working with the parents one-on-one -on -one in their homes and getting those kids ready for school. So it was more of a school-based program. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so we have to figure that piece out, too, is how to get out of project funding and... You heard Rasmussen talk. So they don't. Trevor was talking about yeah. when I talked to him on the phone. He was talking more about we need to find a way to get like get these direct services uh, into some type of reimbursement program with Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And what is the pathway to do that? Sorry, say that again. Uh, yeah. How, how do you get? I don't know that it would work for uh, for literacy or for on the educational side, but on the medical side, health health outcome, outcomes focusing on those. How would you get that type of service funded or reimbursed through Medicaid? What's the process for doing that? It's usually. Um, or is that even a viable alternative? Well, it may, be, it may be viable. It yeah. just depends. There's a lot of caveats. And, um, and then what type of organization would have to be in place to do that? Because, you know, most smaller communities, small organizations, tribes, Probably uh, might, couldn't wouldn't have the systems to no. be able to do that. It would it would take a lot of money to so because, put in place. So um, because Medicaid is a healthcare payer right. resource, you have to be a Medicaid provider, um, and I think that's their terminology. So try not to think of one person as your healthcare provider, but just uh, like Norton Sound, an organization. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so if you had um, an organization like Norton Sound, they're a provider, and they set up a community health worker program to serve a specific population, they might be able to um, make a case and get a Medicaid waiver to cover those services. Certainly, there's language in Medicaid that describes these things. Um, other states have training in uh, community health workers categories of workers. And um, they serve various populations, including the elderly. So I mean this is this is probably the more thought of population actually that can serve. Um, but here, I I would say it's not something to discount um, in the concept to, to remember and remember. I don't um, I didn't see the full list of who's on the line, but um, for questions on, on Medicaid comes to kids, I would speak with, um, for tribal, Renee Gayhart in Juneau, and um, Barbara Hale, she's in Denali, she's Denali Kid Care, they would know to answer. Barbara who? Barbara Hale, H-A-L-E. So our organization, RollCast, just got um, eligible to Medicaid bill. It's for a supportive housing division, but in early childhood, we're interested in it because we clearly see the path for being able to serve, um, provide early intervention services for children that are potentially Medicaid billable, but we clearly need to expand the definition of potentially at risk here in our state. And again, I don't know um, how easy, Jennifer, what is, Jen, what is Jennifer's last name? She also is at the State Department of Health. Um, um, she is previously from the Medicaid side and has come over to uh, take on the early childhood systems mm -hmm. coordinator position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, she, yeah, she has um, clearly stated to the Governor's Advisory Council that this is an avenue we need to explore here in the state. And, so. and there's a number of different mm -hmm. or, uh, projects, uh, three different organizations who are also looking at this one thing is helping grow. Um, discussion about it. One of the things for tribal health programs, it may be a little easier to make a case with the system or something like this through Medicaid. 
So I, I would just really keep it laid out there on the table. We um, were actually the lead agency, or will be shortly the lead agency for Help Me Grow. So I can answer okay. questions on Help Me Grow. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> well, um, it, we have not explored home visiting within Help Me Grow. Right now we're in the getting ready to soft launch the program, which is a kind of a referral system for connecting kids with services that they need and have a centralized phone access point, like a call center with care coordinators. Um, and so it's certainly something to explore in the future, not something we'd be able to, to do off the bat. And, but um, it's also written into the ECCS grant Help Me Grow program, so again, Jennifer Moreau is a good contact to speak that, um, but, you know, looking into, with it, in terms of tribal, um, I'm certainly not an expert on, on home visiting, but uh, maybe exploring ways where we could take advantage of, you know, they offer the, the community health aids, the behavioral health aids, so some sort of model, um, like Cheryl talked about, through the, the, the um, the regional providers like Norton Sound are exposed. Yeah, and so one of the one of the things about um, most home visiting programs is that they include they don't work in isolation. They include a uh, coordination element, so child um, issues or whatever that involve other um, sources or systems of care. And so that's where I'm seeing similarity with Help Me Grow. I understand they don't go in the home, but um, the care coordination component from the health context, which can be very broad, including behavioral health, um, I feel like that's a, that's kind of like a avenue, if you will. And um, certainly, if, you know, the ACEs information, um, documenting that, um, you know, specifically with areas that you want to start looking at this Medicaid idea uh, would be a way to make a case to Medicaid that they're going to save money by spending money. Because that's always a big point of discussion. So, like, I'm a persistent. I'm, Congratulations. <laughs> I, like, like, we're really interested in education, and, like, I was thinking, does Logos have, like, the, like, the ABC most program, like, or the online facility? Yeah, no, no, um, we do have online resources, but we don't have a systematic, you know, opportunity that, across the state. Well, that would be, like, a possibility with, you know, school districts to, like, collaboration programs, mm -hmm. because I want to see like, teachers want them to yeah. It's a good idea. Especially young parents. I mean, we're really trying to shift our um, use of technology. Um, a lot of parents uh, appreciate getting a text during the week that says something wonderful about what you can do with your child versus us handing out a monthly, monthly newsletter that has. So, you know, with HIPAA privacy, all the privacy things, we're now trying to figure out how do we Best communicate with our younger uh, there parents is a, across there the is state. There is a text program. I forget what it's called. Text yeah. for baby. What is that? Text for baby. Text for text baby. For baby. Yeah. yeah. But also, you know, contacting Thread, and mm -hmm. because they may know of some. They're the, the early child care network. But so I mean, you're not necessarily looking for child care, but they will know to tell you about any kinds of existing programs. Um, of course, there's. Imagination Library, but you guys are not subscribed to that. On the on the Medicaid reimbursement solution, is there are there particular particular programmatic barriers or infrastructure barriers to implementing that? That A and A, for example, being a project based funding source, could also overcome. They're regulatory and they're statutory. I think that's where we have to. I mean, it'd be worth a conversation with Jennifer and some of the folks you mentioned. Um, 
because as you know, our state has not been quick to redefine eligibility requirements for even like our Denali Kid Care program with the sort of fiscally conservative. I guess the policymakers we're talking to are very worried about growing federal reliance on funds here in the state because they believe that sooner or later the federal funds will dry up and the state will be holding the um, bag. But um, I mean, it's worth a focus group conversation, definitely, on I don't know what the role. And what about on the IHS side, though? Are there funding opportunities on the on that side, you know, through the compacts and? I don't know, like, you know, just in general, what I mean, there are that they traditionally are funded at about 50% of need, and that's so. not looking at this kind of expanded need. It's just looking at kind of more your bare bones, if you will. Right. I mean, so I, I guess I, I don't think that would be something that I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to get the health corporation directors together to CEOs or some of their fiscal folks to talk about what what is the path? Is there a path? The other thing I was going to say is, um, you know, we've had pretty good success across our state about getting Native organizations to invest in their shareholders for secondary education. Yeah. Um, we've been trying to get them to talk about, yes, um, their investment in, again, the very beginning lives of their shareholders. And we have not had great success with that. Um, there have been organizations investing in best beginnings, you know, books for children, very um, $40 a year per child, a pretty, you know, relatively conservative cost. Um, but that, I absolutely believe that that's part of If you consider the, the 8A program with the corporation, mm -hmm. we're a company or so. Mm -hmm. We're required to file a benefits report every year, so you know, someone can make the case to invest not only in post-secondary, but early. Basically, just investing on the online courses. Can you be part of our task force on that? <laughs> <laughs> so specific things like that, like developing that online curriculum for mm -hmm. that she's mentioning, could mm -hmm. be an ANA-funded project. I think, and I didn't speak to it, but. One of the things that we really recognize is help, you know, to help children get an equal footing into ki kindergarten or future school success. You know, many communities just don't have a lot of literacy, uh, print-rich environments. You know, here kids grow up in Anchorage and they're learning the letter A and or M and they see M on the McDonald's sign. You know, you see numbers on houses, street signs. So that, you know, associating what's happening in your classroom or in your home with sort of learning about the world. We've been challenged by being, again, very intentional about helping to introduce what doesn't necessarily make sense all at once out to young children in the rural villages, because I'm learning the alphabet, but I don't see it a lot of places. So again, I think your suggestion about having online curriculum, other type of things that could be interactive between parents and their child, could be another really good solid foundation for sort of early literacy. What about Johnson and Molly? I know a lot of the school districts get those funds. They're mm -hmm. basically for um, Native Americans. Uh, sometimes they just pay for like cultural resources, but other times and when I was a tribal administrator, we we contracted for those dollars and then we used them to pay for tutors, but it could easily pay for home visit visitors if it's uh, education focused. It has paid for, for example, in Ketchikan, Head Start program, bringing in a fluent uh, native speaker into, right. you know, the classroom to help. Um, I don't know if Johnson O'Malley funds are still as robust as what they. I don't know. Yeah. They've been folded into the tribes, uh, tribal what they call tribal priority allocations. So now it's up to the tribes when, if they're the contractors to decide how much they want to shift that way. Thank you. I would um one last thing. When you talk to Jennifer Moreau over at ECCS to talk to her about strengthening families because um that is some, so Shirley Pitts, who used to be the program officer for ECCS, 
um, she's still a private contractor, and they, she and Jennifer go around the state doing strengthening family trainings, and it's ways for communities to in, in incorporate the protective factors into into the community in different ways and find creative ways to incorporate those. So maybe it's partnerships with the local libraries or um, or with then you know services that are provided to folks. So just kind of you know thinking about ways that existing services within communities can start. If you can't have that home visiting component right away, but start figuring out ways to reach out to families and. Um, and have more maybe like community-wide events around um, around some of the things that may be reviewed during a home visiting mm -hmm. uh, during a home visit or something like that. But, uh, just building. But I'm happy to stay in touch with you Thank all you. and continue to Thank talk you. about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and I and I invited Jennifer, but she couldn't make it yeah. today. So she's. Kind of busy schedule right here. We're you know we have about four minutes left. I wish we had about three hours so, to do this. Uh, it's back on Medicaid, so there is a process if you go online to Medicaid where you can apply um, to be well if you are a Medicaid provider. I mean, first you apply to be a Medicaid provider, and then you uh, can apply to do one of these um, projects that's called Care Coordination. It's not specifically home visiting, but home visiting might be familiar, that that might be part of that. I, I think it, Medicaid is the whole pie, but it could be a slice of the pie. And um, anyway, I would think that maybe your organization and working with Medicaid and, and learning how to support um, organizations to go through that process, that might be a way of trying to help that along. It does exist. I mean, obviously, it's real cap. I don't know what your um, scope is with them, but um, you know, there is a process, and very few organizations are doing it. I think there might only be two in the state. It's not being starting. It's not being. Well, what is the name of the process, or what? what um. Well, okay, first Because there's a lot of Medicaid providers. First you have to be a Medicaid provider. Okay. And then you apply, um, and I'm sorry to be, but it's either care coordination, case management, <coughs> or a, a specific population, specific kind. You have to have a specific scope, which we did that easy for us, right? Um, like mental health services mm -hmm. or okay. behavioral health. Something related to healthy pregnancy that would be, I mean, it's a variety. Um, Are there home visiting projects across the, the, the state components of SMCME? Um, some of them are billing under that key management component, so it is possible. It is an extensive process. So it might be, you know, the interesting thing that might be to do is because it is such a heavy lift is to think about these there's of a consortium or an umbrella agency that that can happen under. Um, but I want to bring us, we have like three minutes left. I, that, that half an hour went by fast. Wow. So I have a strategy one as a suggestion to explore the Medicaid case management special component. Um, what do you think about bringing that forward as well? And I would do slash care coordination because they have after case management, because they Medicaid has various definitions. It is not the easiest strategy to it, be number one. It's it. probably and, is. and I, I think it's that yeah, not short term. It is to yeah. me. It might be a long term, depending on how the administration looks at it. But um, yeah, I mean, but I think a lot of the organizations really have trouble. They don't have the capacity to have like the kind of I mean, still we're back to relying on federal state funds. Mm -hmm. And what I think we want to tap into a little bit more, and you bring up a good point, is sort of local revenue being generated, although very, um, you know, desperately needed for other type of services in the community is, is 
in addition to the federal state, what can we do locally? Um, I would definitely want to see us put a strategy up there about, um, you know, setting up an opportunity to dialogue with communities about possibilities for their community revenue sharing funds or... Oh, do they still exist? They do, but they went right, down they this are. year. They're phasing them out. They are. Okay, so I'll find another word for that. Um, <laughs> uh, I, about just, I mean, whether it's gaming or the tribe... Mitigation funds. $38, but basically... Panic dollars. ...the contribution to yep. leverage some of these other dollars. Yep. And, including the corporations. So it's a combination of native corporations, possibly tribes with their 638, you know, allocating a little bit of that. Mining, you know, Don Lynn Creek. I mean, there's lots of mining going around uh, permits in the state. Um, I know they have to... Uh, this is uh, our breakout group two is coming back in. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> Hello. Responding. I I'm going to take just a minute and I'll bring in um, breakout group one. I don't know that they have rejoined us, but I'll join everybody together here in just a moment. Half an hour that went by way too fast. Yes, it did. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Barbara. I'll br I'll bring everybody back. Okay. So welcome back, everyone. I know Barbara and her breakout group are back in the main room. Maria, have have you and your breakout group joined now? Yep, we are here. Excellent. Thank you. I was just telling Barbara that the half an hour that went by way too fast. It did. But as mentioned, when we started this breakout process, we hope that this is the beginning of many more conversations to come to continue this topic. So, Barbara, I'll turn it over for our large group discussion to you, and thank you for participating that process. Sure. Um, so what I thought we'd do is just hear a report from each of the groups, and then um, we've got some great notes up here. So thank you to those who volunteered to um, report out. Um, and then we will, Petra is going to be uh, trying to capture our recommended action. So uh, to the extent that you can be kind of specific about that, that would be great. Um, and then we will have a chance to um, actually weigh in on our top choices for moving forward. Uh, so I'm going to um, change this up a little bit. And uh, first we'll hear from uh, breakout group Three. So I don't know um, who's the recorder. Uh, recorder, recorder. Um, if you could speak up, that would be great. Sure. Well, I won't put anyone on the spot because I know Pam left and, and we were just getting to that toward the end of who would report. So this is Maria, and I'm happy to share a little bit about what we discussed um, in our group. And I would just welcome Drew or um, Karen to to jump in if they feel I've missed something. Um, but in terms of strategies to leverage new and existing funding, um, we had a couple folks share that they have, uh, there's some kind of new and openness from OCS at the state level to um, fund home visiting um, through their family preservation funding stream and uh, those folks have shared that, you know, it's been kind of a challenge to get that relationship um, underway and, and get the differences navigated, but it, it's definitely been doable and um, the folks are feeling like it's a, a great new opportunity to both partner with the state in a different way and increase the resource that's um, supporting home visiting at a local level. Um, we also talked about the opportunity for partnership 
between home visiting and those environmental health resources, um, knowing that there are resources available to um, support healthy environments, including a healthy home environment, that that's kind of a new opportunity for partnership and talked a little bit about, you know, what that looks like and how um, home visiting can in some ways be flexible, um, that there have been opportunities to provide kind of expanded information through um, groups of parents that are receiving home visiting services and really recognizing that, that there are some flexible opportunities to engage um, new and maybe um, not the usual partners in supporting this work. In terms of strategies for building a stronger system, um, our group really talked about um, the fact that, you know, because of Alaska's geography and kind of structure at the um, with the local villages and tribes that there really is, you know, sometimes a lot of effort that's just required to get everybody on the same page at a local level um, and that it, expanding that idea to maybe engaging the rural health nonprofit corporations or um, more discussion at a corporation level might help kind of expand that um, coordination and collaboration that does seem to focus largely at a local level. And I think um, the point was really brought up that it's hard um, at this point to really have that full state picture because a lot of the efforts are focused at a local piece um, that the local players don't and there isn't necessarily that feeling of a big state picture. So the map was noted as a really helpful um, starting point and, you know, I think everybody's in the place of really appreciating this opportunity to kind of expand the conversation to really think about the state picture versus focusing solely on the local picture. Thank you, Maria. Anybody else from um, Breakout Group 3 want to add anything to that? Okay, great. I can already see that there are going to be some themes through these groups, just knowing what our group talked about. Um, so we have a, a group that was on site in the room together, um, which is probably a little bit easier than trying to do this virtually. Um, but uh, So I'll, I'll uh, turn to them next and uh, see who's going to be reporting out from this group. Is everybody looking at everybody else and wondering who's going to report? <laughs> no, uh, this is Anthony. Um, I'm just going through the notes here. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase. Um, so some of the things we came up with was to explore Medicaid case management and care coordination special projects, um, looking at we talked a lot about the process of, the, of or the continuum where you become a, a Medicaid provider and then being able to reimburse for some of those service, services and what is the process for that. Um, and we, we talked about looking at local revenue sources to leverage other dollars. And those, this, the ideas that came forth kind of ran the gamut from uh, from local gaming contributions, which has its own controversy, um, to looking at um, native corporations that focus so almost solely on post-secondary education and less, or to know to very you know, minimally on the uh, you know before on the early childhood. Uh, and maybe a, maybe a, a, an education effort to get some of the native corporations to look at the broader spectrum and getting them involved at, at an earlier uh, point. And I'm speaking on, as a native 8A company myself, and I shared that uh, as an 8A, so-called 8A company, you know, we have to report annually on our own on our own contributions, and typically uh, scholarships are one of them, but uh, 
So it's interesting to hear that perspective to focus on early childhood. Um, and then there's other local possible sources of, of revenue from tribes operating their 638 and their compacts, although they're stretched very thin, but um, they have the flexibility to take, for instance, uh, their, their Johnson O'Malley program and, and put a little bit more into that to help partially fund a, a local um, home visiting program coordinator or position. Um, there was a um, suggestion to develop a online curriculum, so using technology as well as part of the solution. And I think that's probably, I could go on, but. <laughs> so those are some of the ideas. Thanks. So Barbara, the, the first, the, the three strategies that are our priority um, are to explore the Medicaid case coordination possibility, look closer at local funding revenues, and strategy two and three could potentially be combined, um, setting up a dialogue with local leaders and exploring those local revenue sources. So those are our top priorities that we chose, and I'll move those up on top. Excellent. Anybody else who's um, on site want to add anything? to this description. Okay, great job, Anthony. Um, and lastly, our group was breakout group two, and Marisa from South Central is going to report for us. Hi, good morning, or good afternoon, depending on which part of the country you're in. Um, so a lot of what we talked about in group two was actually already mentioned by both groups and three and one. Um, and so I'm not sure how much more I have to add. Um, I think one thing is the, the conversation around the state picture and really trying to leverage the existing state groups to, that are working in early childhood to incorporate the um, home visiting programs across the state so we can better share resources. One of the questions was, hey, do you guys share trainings? And at the local level in Anchorage, we've done a pretty good job, at least with the NFP programs, but I don't know if uh, We've reached out to RollCap to see what kind of special trainings they're doing and if there's a way to share um, in that. So I think that if we had a better statewide picture um, of what the different programs are doing and how to contact each other and really got that conversation going, it would be really helpful in leveraging um, the work um, that could be done. And uh, I've heard a numerous people that are on this call already say, please, no more new groups in the state. So I really don't want to add anything new but better leverage what we have. And Marisa, would you maybe want to talk about your idea about the using the ECCS um, group as a way to think about the the agenda? Yeah, that seems like a natural fit. That's something that our advisory committee had mentioned as well. Um, that, that we just need to get that moving in a more comprehensive fashion. So I think that's something that's doable um, because they're interested in all of the things that are going on in the state. So, and they work really close to the Children's Trust as well and are leveraging those trainings and resources and um, even working with Tamar um, a little more closely from the state, state point of view instead of just the local point of view. Is that, there's a lot of opportunity there. Anybody else break out uh, group two want to add anything to that? So I, I think to summarize some of the uh, things that we talked about in terms of strategies, um, I, we would definitely, uh, we talked about Medicaid as a strategy, so I think that that one is, is one that we shared with uh, the group that was in the room. This, this idea Marissa mentioned of um, shared trainings across programs and maybe even a beginning step of really having a better picture of what those programs are statewide so that the connections can be made. And then I think the last the the last thing that Marissa mentioned was about the uh, having a, a shared public private agenda um, on more of a statewide level, uh, perhaps through the early childhood comprehensive systems. Um, so now that that we can see what uh, Petra is uh, typing in here, which is always 
a, a challenge to try to keep up with somebody who's talking. But I don't know. I mean, back, uh, Maria, back to your group. I don't know if we captured, um, if there are other things that we should capture from your group. Yeah, M M Maria's priorities is two or three priorities. I don't know what the group feels in terms of priority. I mean, I definitely think um, that idea of um, expanding the local conversation to um, integrate with the larger state picture. And you know, I think we talked about different ways of potentially doing that, but I would say, you know, that was kind of a, a common thread that touched a couple of different pieces. And I think, Petra, that probably two and three were kind of combined. I mean, they were both mm -hmm. Medicaid uh, strategies. Um, I, I want to make a suggestion, Barbara. I, you know, I know we said to maybe think about voting on some of these things today and see which ones might be most important to the group. But I'm just wondering, because we had some folks that needed to leave and we um, are, you know, extended our time, I'm wondering if we can't just send this out um, to the larger group as a voting option perhaps yeah. survey monkey or something. I, heard, mm -hmm. I see a lot of heads nodding in the room. I think there's consensus in this room that maybe to do that so we get a larger voice on those priorities. I think that's great. And, you know, with uh, four that we have listed here, I, that, that's a fairly doable list with mm -hmm. some input from other people. So I think you're right. Um, but, you know, I didn't get to make my cute little joke that I was going to assure you that the election was not rigged when we voted for these. So, um, <laughs> <a little> <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm going to turn it back to you, Anthony, uh, to kind of close us out. Okay. Before, before I turn this over to Anthony, I just want to say a couple of things. I really want to um, thank Anthony and his team for providing the opportunity to have this initial conversation. I know that was um, a heavy lift for his team, so I wanted to say that I really appreciate your time and commitment to home visiting and that conversation and the support to increasing sustainability for home visiting across the state. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely want to thank everybody, especially uh, past Petra's organization um, and Petra herself for um, really spearheading this. And, you know, we, we really struggled with, you know, how could we tackle this issue? The ideal scenario would have been to have a summit where everybody could come into town, but uh, we're all limited by resources and our contracts and our scopes of work. Um, so we tried to figure out a way that we could get the ball rolling Get this, uh, get, generate some excitement about about this, and then pave the way for, for future dialogues. And uh, this was the format that we came up with. And uh, I tell you, it's been really exciting working with Petra. Uh, we've kind of merged some of our technology. Some we've sent an evaluation out uh, in the chat box. We're eager to to get your feedback on uh, on the facilitation and some of the tools that we've used. Um, since we all couldn't all be in, in one room, um, we've really uh, tried to push the envelope to engage people in a virtual format. Um, so I'm excited that we've got uh, some direction here, and uh, I certainly will. My team will work with with Petra to get the uh, to do this poll with the participants. And uh, other than that. Uh, Guyana from the Alaska region for everybody's participation and hard work, and um, we look forward to continuing this discussion. So, Biochi, thank you.